Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. Trust that you guys are well. In our lesson today, we're going to focus on nutrition and specifically we're looking at the process of absorption, assimilation and ejection. The context of our lesson is based on that we have looked at the digestive system. Before we get into these complex processes, it's important to review the entire digestive system, have an overview of some of the important terms, and then we get into the processes that we need to discuss. Remember that nutrition is an important part of every living organism. Organisms need to be able to access food to get the nutrients that are required. The nutrients are needed for the purpose of growth, repair, energy, and metabolism. And so all of these are important in individuals being able to access nutrients. So let's look at the digestive system in detail, have an overview of the alimentary canal, parts associated with them, and then we'll move on to these complex processes of absorption, assimilation, and ejection. So guys, as I always mention, it's important that we go through a set of terms. I know that this section has an elaborate set of terms that you need to refine and put down on a piece of paper. Go through these guys, they're important. And I encourage you to make note of these terms as we get into the lesson. As an overview, the core concepts that we're looking at is the overview of the process of digestion. We're gonna have some context around the organs of the digestive system so that we understand these processes that we're focusing on today, which is absorption, which is basically taking in the products after they are chemically broken down. And then assimilating would be to put things together. So we, things are broken down into their simplest forms, they're absorbed, and then the cells take them in and put them together into, into proteins or amino acids, into complex proteins that are needed by the body. And then finally, what happens to parts that are not needed, parts that cannot be digested from our meals, and how that is released, so that is ejection. And then we'll spend some time trying to sharpen our understanding by looking at some application activities in our revision segment. As I always mention, a list of terms are fundamentally important. So I may not go through all of these terms, but I'm gonna to refer to some of the most important ones as we get into the lesson. So guys, we often talk about the bolus, which again, if I remind you, is the ball of food that passes through the alimentary canal once we have chewed the food well. It mixes with saliva, and that softened ball of food moves through the esophagus, allowing for it to travel through much easier than a, a chunk of meal that hasn't been processed by chewing. We will look at the concept of what bile is in a bit, and bile is again a secretion produced by the liver that helps in breaking down the fat molecules into smaller droplets. We will spend some time looking at the endocrine glands, which is the pancreas having both an endocrine function in terms of producing hormones, as well as producing enzymes. An important process throughout the digestive system is peristalsis. And that again refers to the contraction of the muscles along the digestive system, pushing food along. And if you do remember and recollect that peristalsis is an involuntary action, meaning that you don't have control of it. And this happens whether you are standing on your head or lying flat. The food will move through the digestive system because of muscle contractions. So if you ever wondered what happens on space, peristalsis still takes place. So those astronauts that are having a meal do not rely on gravity pulling the food down. It's actually because of muscle contractions. And so those muscles contract and relax and with those movements propel the food along the digestive system. The next concept would be looking at the structure of villi and when we look at the small intestine later in our segment today, we will look at what these folds of tissue are on the inside of the small intestine. And these folds are called villi. They're basically finger-like projections that stick out from this tube into the internal lumen or hole and allows for movement of food through. Ingestion is a process which we've discussed previously where food is taken into the mouth. Digestion, we refer to that as the physical and the chemical breakdown of food from complex molecules into simple monomers. In our focus today, we're going to spend a lot of time looking at absorption. 
So what happens after chemical digestion? We find that the products need to be then diffused into the blood system or absorbed in. And so that is absorption. And finally, we're going to look at the process of assimilation. And the word assimilate essentially refers to put together. So once they absorbed, these nutrients such as amino acids and your simple glucose molecules and your fatty acids and glycerol are put together into what the body and the cells need. And then finally, what happens with parts that are not needed? So the undigested and the unabsorbed products are then removed from the body through the external opening in the form of fe feces. So we would look at that. And then we have discussed what mastication is as a concept process of chewing. We looked at enzymes and the different types of enzymes in the chemical digestion process. We also talked about the different groups of enzymes that are important in digestion. And we also will look at today the central vessel in the villi that allow for the absorption of nutrients, the process of removing excess amino acids as deamination, and then finally, all of this is important for the chemical processes in the body, which is called metabolism. Right, so before we get into the lesson and look at these complex processes, let's have an overview of the parts and their locations. And it's important that we go through this knowing that there's an alimentary canal that is the main parts of the digestive system, but there are also accessory organs associated with that. So the mouth is obviously the organ through which food is ingested. We have got teeth in there, and we've got salivary glands that all assist in the mechanical process of digestion. We then have food moving through the pharynx, down the esophagus, into the muscular bag called the stomach. The movement of food down here is through peristalsis, which we've discussed already. Food from the stomach then moves into the small intestine, of which the first part is called the duodenum, followed by the middle part of the small intestine called the jejunum, which then finally ends in the ileum. And that connects into the first part of the large intestine or colon called the ascending. Ascending because this is the part that moves up. We then have the transverse colon, and then finally ending off with the descending colon, where the undigested food is stored in the rectum until it is released and ingested through the anus. The other accessory organs associated with the digestive system are the liver, which produces the bile, and that bile is stored in the gallbladder, which is then released into the duodenum for the digestion of proteins and other complex molecules. So guys, that's a wrap for the overview of the digestive system. Let's have a little break, and when we get back, we will look at complex processes such as the breakdown, absorption, and the assimilation. So have a little comfort break, grab something to eat, and when we get back, we will look at how that is digested and absorbed. Cheers, see you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners. Let's continue with our lesson today. We focused on nutrition in our first segment and we looked at the overview of terms and the process of the parts and their functions. In this part of the lesson, we're gonna look at the process that we're referring to today in terms of what happens after chemical digestion. It's important that we understand how the body and especially the alimentary canal is structurally adapted for the absorption of nutrients. And we'll then look at how that is assimilated. It's important that we understand and have an overview of all the processes before we get into specifically absorption and assimilation. Right, so the process of digestion occurs across a number of stages, including ingestion and digestion, which we've spoke about earlier on. I'm gonna try and unpack these concepts in detail in a bit. Followed by digestion is a process called absorption, we then assimilate and we take things and put them together as we needed and we remove unwanted waste products. So what does ingestion mean? 
Again, the act of taking in food through the mouth is called ingestion. And that we refer to as eating food. So we ingest the food. The next bit would be digesting the food. And digestion refers to die, again, breaking down. So br the breakdown, which also includes the physical breakdown as well as the chemical breakdown. Again, in terms of the physical breakdown, we must refer to what happens in the mouth during the chewing process, as well as what happens in the stomach with the churning process between the food that mixes with the gastric juices. That is all, again, a physical mechanism of breaking down food into smaller particles or smaller building blocks. We also need to look at that digestion occurs chemically and that we require enzymes for that process. And the enzymes that we refer to were essentially the three groups of enzymes which digest carbohydrates, your enzymes that digest your proteins, and then finally those enzymes that digest your fats. So your fatty acids and your lipids essentially are those groups that we look at. We then focus on how these are absorbed and the products and how they are transported from the digestive system into what we refer to as the bloodstream, and then from there to all cells. We also need to look at, in detail, the assimilation process, which essentially is how are these food products which are digested, then put together and converted into what the body needs in terms of the cellular needs, okay? And then finally, the elimination, which is the removal of the undigested food residues or parts that the body does not need and how it's released from the body as a semi-solid fecal matter or feces. Right. So it is good to have an overview of this process, starting with how the process occurs. We looked at ingestion, then from ingestion to digestion, the process of absorption finally ending with ejection. Right, that's a good overview of the flow diagram of this process of digestion. Let's have an overview of the drawing of the digestive system and try and unpack again a basic function of each of the parts. Okay, again, we looked at the mouth, again, where food then mixes with saliva and it's broken down chemically uh, with the enzymes produced by the salivary glands, along with the digestion that happens mechanically by the teeth, which forms a ball of food called the bolus. That bolus moves down the esophagus, which is a muscular tube through which the food is transported to the stomach. Guys, in the stomach, we see it is a muscular bag lined with mucus, which is important in protecting the stomach. Strong enzymes are released, which are acidic in nature, and that begins the process of protein digestion. All of that is mixed with the digastric juices to form what we refer to as chyme, and that chyme then moves into the first part of the small intestine called the duodenum, which is right here. We also need to recognize the presence of the pancreas, which for serves both as an endocrine gland because it produces hormones, as well as an exocrine gland because it produces enzymes. And so we see that the pancreas produces secretions directly into the duodenum. If, as we continue into the small intestine, we know that it is made up of three parts, the duodenum, the ileum, and then the jejunum. The ileum is the last part that connects to the large intestine, which contains the ascending colon, the transverse colon, and then finally the descending colon. And this is where most of the water and ions are absorbed. And water plays an important part in our digestion process. It's because it allows for water to be a chemical sol solution in which most of the chemical reactions happen. It also forms a transport medium for the ions that are transported along the digestive system. And finally, we find the, the rectum in which the the undigested food and the waste products are temporarily stored, and then the anus, which is the opening through which the waste products are released. Let's go further up to the liver and unpack the importance of the liver. The liver is an important gland or organ that produces 
bile. That bile is stored in the gallbladder, and that gallbladder concentrates the bile and then releases the bile into the duodenum. The liver plays an important role in detoxifying certain molecules, so alcohol, the medication and drugs that we take are all detoxified by the liver. It also stores some important vitamins, iron, as well as glycogen. And glycogen is an important complex carbohydrate that the body stores and keeps when needed. That glycogen is converted back into glucose to provide energy. Okay, and that's again a wrap of the overview of the digestive system. Let's focus specifically on the small intestine because that is where we're going with today. We're going to look at the process of how absorption takes place. Again, if we talk about the small intestine, the yellow bit there is the duodenum. We've got the middle bit called the jejunum here, and I've indicated that with a key at the bottom. And then the last bit, which is the ileum, which connects to the large um, colon. And that is the ascending colon, moving across the transverse colon, further coming down the descending colon. Finally, ending with the rectum and an opening called the anus. Guys, it's important that we recognize that there's a structure here called the appendix, which is a vestigial structure, a part that we no longer need and has become redundant or has lost its significant function. And that has got to do how, with how the diet of humans have changed and hence the need for this appendix no longer has become, it's become obsolete and we can actually survive without an appendix. Right. So let's look at the internal structure of the small intestine. So remember that the intestine is a long tube that is highly coiled. However, when we take a section through that, essentially when we cut through this tube and look at a cross section or a transverse section through it, we see that there are many folds on the internal lining filled with finger-like projections lining the internal lumen. So this is the internal lumen through which the food passes. Lining that on the internal surface are finger-like projections called villi. Here I've zoomed into some of these finger-like projections called villi. Let's unpack that now. So the walls of the small intestine have the following important layers. The outer layer of longitudinal muscles, again, Throughout the digestive system, we've got muscles lining the digestive system. These are a combination of longitudinal muscles that run along the digestive system, along with an inner layer on the inside of that called circular muscles. And so these muscles work antagonistically, meaning opposite each other. When one contracts, the other relaxes. And that muscle action allows for the esophagus and the digestive and the alimentary canal to move and push food along. So that you would see here, you've got your layer of your longitudinal muscles followed with your circular muscles in there. A highly folded inner epithelial layer which absorbs the digested food is present in this area here. So that's your epithelial lining which is further modified to become structurally suited for its function. So let's look at the inner epithelial. The inner epithelial lining of the intestine is highly folded with finger-like projections called villi. A, plural, a singular for that will be the villus. So here we can see many villi, which are these finger-like projections projecting into the internal lumen. Here we see them extending into the internal lumen. Many villi will protrude into the intestinal lumen, greatly increasing the available surface area for absorption. So, if we were to look through the digestive system and the cross-section through the small intestine, it is not a hollow tube. Within it, you've got lots of finger-like projections, as you see. And the concept behind this is that if we were to unpack that, and if we were to straighten this layer out, so if that's the fold, and if we were to stretch this out, it will probably now have a much larger surface area. So compare, combine several of these villi and that line or this total surface area through which 
absorption can take place becomes significantly longer. It means now we've got a larger surface through which the absorption of the nutrients can take place. And that's a remarkable ad adaptation that we see in terms of the efficiency of the small intestine for maximizing how nutrients are absorbed. Okay, cool. So guys, on closer inspection, we can look at the structure of the small intestine. We can see that these finger-like projections project into the internal lumen. So here's the lumen, and this is where food and the nutrients are passing through once they are digested. It is through these finger-like projections that these monomers are absorbed. You can see that the internal core is filled with lots of blood capillaries, arteries and veins that are there to efficiently absorb and transport the nutrients away. Well guys, that was a wrap for the first segment. We've had an overview of the digestive system. We've looked at the parts. We've kind of looked at the overview of what happens when digestion occurs. It's important that we now get into the process of absorption. Let's have a little break and I'll see you in a bit. Welcome life science learners back to our lesson on nutrition. In our lesson today we're focusing on the process of digestion, specifically looking at how the absorption of nutrients takes place. We've looked at the structural adaptation of the, the small intestine with the presence of villi increasing the surface area for efficient and maximum absorption. Let's get into the detail of how absorption actually takes place once chemical digestion has been complete. Absorption is a crucial part of the digestive system, enabling the body to be able to extract maximum amounts of nutrients. And hence, we need to look at the efficiency of the digestive system. Before we get into that, I want you to reflect on why is the small intestine folded and elongated into a large tube that is compacted into this small area. And the, one of the reasons is that it allows the food to pass through the digestive system, taking much longer so that the process of chemical digestion can be efficiently completed. And that is what maximizes the ability for us to extract most of the nutritional value from the food that we consume. Over and above that, we see that the intestine is structurally modified internally to increase the absorption of nutrients. Let's look at all those factors as we unpack the process of absorption. Right, so what does absorption mean? If we go back to absorption, we know that absorption again points to how pro substances are taken in. So absorption takes place in the small intestine because much of the food has been digested by the time it reaches the small intestine. Remember that the small intestine has three areas. The first part of the duodenum is where lots of the chemical digestion takes place. We see that further continuing in the middle part of the jejunum, where more enzymes break down the food. And this is where it slows down and it undergoes a series of chemical uh, reactions breaking down the food. And then we finally see in the ileum where large amounts of absorption of your building blocks, your nutrients take place. And so it goes through a process where that maximizes the time for digestion. The food particles in the small intestine are therefore small enough to be absorbed. Remember that the idea behind chemical digestion is to break down complex molecules into series of smaller molecules till they are the smallest building blocks that can be easily absorbed. Right, so the small intestine has a large surface area to absorb nutrients. It is approximately six meters long. And that six meter long allows for us to be able to have a much longer process of food passing through this elongated tube. The walls of the small intestine contain transverse folds. As I mentioned earlier on, when we looked at that, we saw that there were lots of these folds on the internal surface area. Again, those folds increase the amount of 
space available for enzyme activity. The inner walls of the small intestine have millions of finger-like projections called villi. So on these folds, there are further projections on them called villi. And we also see that each of these villi contain further folds called microvilli to increase. So we see then, if we were to zoom onto these guys, we'll find that onto these, there are even smaller folds called microvilli. So let's look at that as an overview. We first said that the adaptation of the small intestine is that it's about six meters long. So it means that food takes much longer to pass through. It's also folded, so it squeezes through and it comes in contact with maximum surface area. These transverse folds that extend into the lumen increase the surface area for food to get in maximum contact with the surface for enzyme activity as well as absorption. Third, we spoke about on these transverse folds, there are further extensions called microvilli on each one of them. So we're seeing a combination of folds increasing the surface area, allowing greater absorption of the digested nutrients. Right, so as I mentioned, you can see the folded inner folds here, the transverse folds extending into the lumen. And then on these folds, we're seeing these villi present on them. And if we were to zoom in onto this, we will see micro villi present. Again, guys, a combination of the idea of intelligent design allowing for efficient absorption. The villi that are responsible for nutrient absorption are adapted to, for absorption in the following ways. So when we talk about the villi, here's a detailed view through that, showing a longitudinal section through each villi. The villus has a thin layer of epithelial tissue on the outside, and this is a one layer thick cell membrane. One layer allows for the quick, easy diffusion of nutrients through this single layer of cells. Internally, there's a network of capillaries which are made up of blood vessels that are able to transport the absorbed nutrients efficiently away. Right in the middle, we have a central vessel called the lacteal, and that lacteal efficiently allows for the absorption of fats and lipids, and it transports them away. We mentioned the concept of capillaries playing an important role in efficient absorption. The epithelial is only one layer thick, as we've just discussed, allowing for nutrients to pass through relatively quickly. We also see the presence of goblet cells, which are not very clear in this diagram, but lining the epithelial layer, we find some cells that are modified to be able to release mucus and enzymes. So we find the goblet cells also secrete mucus to ensure that the absorptive surface is moist and to allow nutrients to dissolve in and then be absorbed. So these produce a mucus that allows for the surface on that to be moistened so that there is quick, easy diffusion of the nutrients in a soluble manner. The villi that are responsible for nutrients also have many mitochondria present in these cells. So when we look at these cells, and if we were to draw one of these cuboidal epithelial cells, they contain many mitochondria. And the mitochondria are important in producing ATP. And that ATP allows for energy, for efficient absorption and rapid active absorption of the nutrients. Finally, we see that there is the lymph vessel, which again is a system of tubes called the lacteal, which is present in the middle that allows each villus to absorb and transport the lipids away effectively. Remember that the lipids are too large to get into the blood capillaries and they are absorbed into these tubes that start in the central villus and then they move and they transport the fat droplets or the monomers of fats away to where it's needed. We also spoke about the rich blood supply and we know that Having a rich blood supply means there is oxygen required for the process of active absorption as well as efficiently transporting the nutrients away. And this influx of blood and the movement of blood away creates what we call a diffusion gradient to move the absorbed nutrients effectively to the rest of the body. 
Here's a schematic diagram showing that where you've got a single layer, the presence of large number of capillaries that efficiently supply blood and move away the nutrients. As I mentioned, the lacteal again forms the lymph vessels that transport them away. We also spoke about the presence of the muscles lining the intestine that allow for the contraction and propulsion of the food along. Here's a cell showing you further microvilli. And these microvilli, again, on these cells, further increase the surface area for active absorption. We mentioned that these cells contain mitochondria, which provide the energy needed for this process. Well, guys, we've just looked at how the small intestine is structurally adapted for absorption. We've looked at the various structures of the villi in terms of the increased surface area, the rich blood supply, the presence of the lacteal, and all these allow for the efficient absorption of the building blocks that are needed by the rest of the body. Guys, you've been an attentive audience. Let's have a little break, and when we get back, we will look at the process of assimilation and ejection. See you in a bit. Welcome back, life science learners, to our final bit of today. In our lesson, we're focusing on the process of digestion where special emphasis is drawn on the absorption, assimilation, and the ejection. We've looked at the structural adaptation of the small intestine. Now let's focus on the process of absorption, and we'll try and apply some questions and our understanding around how to answer these questions. So let's focus on the process of the absorption of the end products. Remember that the ultimate objective of digestion and chemical digestion is to break down these complex molecules into the simplest monomers, simplest building blocks. So we know that proteins are made up of amino acids, that your carbohydrates are made up of your monosaccharides such as glucose, and that fats are broken down into the fatty acid and the lipid molecules. Now that we've got those digested into the simplest forms, we need to be able to absorb them in the small intestine. Let's look at the fate of these molecules. Right, so when we look at absorption, we can look at each of the monomers and where they are absorbed and whether the process is requiring energy or not. So when the absorption requires energy, we say that it is an active process. When it is purely based on a difference in the concentration gradients between the nutrients in the small intestine and in the blood vessel, then we say that it is a passive process. Active process requires energy. Passive process requires a diffusion gradient between concentrations in two different areas. So let's remember that absorption needs to be efficient, and for efficiency, we need to maximize the nutrient absorption. So many of these processes require energy and is an active process. So let's try and consider that when we talk about the absorption. And finally, we need to look at where the absorption takes place in terms of the structure in the small intestine. I want you to also remember that we discussed the structure of the villi and we spoke about the central blood vessels and the central lacteal that transports. So just have that at the back of your mind as we get into this. So when we look at glucose, guys, glucose is absorbed actively. When I say actively, I mean requiring energy. So those cells lining the, the villi produce energy in the form of ATP, and that ATP allows for the cells to actively use the transport molecules to transfer glucose from the, from the lumen inside the intestine into the blood system, which is the blood vessels lining the internal villi. So that's an active process, and that is then absorbed into the central capillary network surrounding the internal core of the villus. Amino acids are the result of protein being digested into the simplest building blocks called amino acids. The absorption of amino acids, again, is an active process. Guys, we need amino acids, and hence we need to actively absorb these so that we can build protein, we can repair cells, and we can form enzymes, because lots of our enzymes are made up of 
amino acids, which is an active process of absorption. That occurs again through the central capillary where the amino acids end up moving through our central capillary in the villi. When we talk about glycerol and fatty acids, that's the breakdown of your fats. So when you consume your fats, those are broken down into the building blocks called glycerol and fatty acids. The absorption of that is a passive process, meaning that it now then moves from the villi, the space in the lumen, into the central lacteal passively based on the diffusion gradient where the concentration is higher there and much lower in the central lacteal, causing the movement into the villi. And that is then absorbed and transported through that central lacteal. We've got to remember that part of a diet, we contain vitamins, minerals, and water. And those are important in the micronutrients in our body. So vitamins are actively as well as passively absorbed based on the concentration in the lumen of the small intestines as well as the need of the body. So you will find that the central blood vessels will transport these vitamins, which are your B12 complexes and your other micronutrients effectively away. Minerals also are absorbed actively with energy as well as passively based on the diffusion gradient, also transported with the blood capillary. And then finally, large amounts of water absorbed in the small intestine, but predominantly in the large intestine where that is maximized. And we see that that is a passive process by osmosis, because remember that osmosis is movement through a membrane from a high water potential through a low water potential to a low water potential. And we see that movement through osmosis. Again, the blood capillaries. So when we look at the structures which take away the absorbed nutrients, apart from fatty acids and glycerol, all other substances are transported via the capillary network in the central villi. So guys, let's have an overview of what we just discussed. So the active absorption requires energy, and that energy comes from the cells which contain mitochondria. And this transports the nutrients are absorbed against the concentration gradient back into the central. So we refer to there's a difference in the concentration in the core. So if we looked at, that's the lumen and that's the lining. So there's a lower concentration on the middle, but there's a higher concentration in the blood capillaries. So we're now moving substances from low to high. And for that process, you need energy and hence it becomes an active process. The passive absorption does not require energy and simply based on diffusion where the substances are moving along from a high concentration to a low concentration, which we see happening in the instance of water and your fats in your lipid, where the concentration of water is much higher in the center of the lumen that then moves in passively based on the diffusion gradient. Let's look at the transport of amino acids and glucose. Glucose and amino acids are the simplest monomers of your carbohydrates and your proteins. And these are absorbed from the small intestine and then transported in the bloodstream to where the cells are needed. Let's look at that in the next diagram. It's important that we understand that glucose is fundamental to all cells having energy. Amino acids, again, I mentioned, are the building blocks of enzymes as well as required for the protein synthesis. So these are important in terms of understanding how these are absorbed and then transported. So your amino acids and glucose are absorbed in the central blood capillaries in the villi of the small intestine. From there, these capillaries join together to form larger venules, so veins that are transporting these substances, to form the hepatic portal vein, which then takes it to the liver. They transport the amino acids and glucose to the liver. So vessels that are associated with the liver, again, are referred to as the hepatic vessels. Again, this is a vein, so it's transporting the glucose as well as the amino acids to the liver. What happens in the liver now? So the glucose and the amino acids flow through into the hepatic vein to the heart. From the heart, some of the liver converts the excess glucose and stores it as glycogen. When needed, the liver will then release that as glucose. The excess amino acids, guys, are then 
deaminated. So the toxic amino groups are removed and that forms urea, which is a waste product that is then re removed from the body through urea as we urinate that. So excess amino acids are deaminated and then released as urea in urine. So the process of assimilation is basically absorbing them into the cells and then producing complex molecules based on the needs of the body. So assimilation is the incorporation of the absorbed nutrients, the building blocks, into the cells of the body. The body cells then absorb these required nutrients which are necessary for building and maintaining larger compounds. So we absorb the amino acids and then we make proteins. For example, your muscle cells will absorb the amino acids from the bloodstream and convert these into proteins. Proteins then will repair and regenerate the muscles. Glucose will then be absorbed by the cells and they will provide the mitochondria with energy for cellular respiration. That in turn produces ATP for cellular metabolism. The liver plays a vital role in the assimilation of nutrients, guys. The liver is responsible for the metabolism of glucose, the removal of the deamination of excess amino acids, so when we remove excess amino acids, as well as the breakdown of alcohol, drugs, and hormones. So the consumption of alcohol, again, affects the liver because the liver has to carry out extensive detoxification of alcohol. Drugs in the form of medication that we take often is toxic to the body and has to be broken down into less toxic substances and then released through our body. Hormones that are not needed, that have served their function, are then broken down and released through the body. So the liver plays an important role in changing the chemical nature of some of the substances that are not needed and then released through excretion. The role of bacteria in the large intestine. When we look at the large intestine, this is where maximum amount of the absorption of water takes place. It's important that we recognize that the bacteria, there are, and there's an active culture or growth of bacteria in our large intestine. Why do we have these bacteria? They play an important relationship in how the absorption and digestion of certain nutrients takes place. So we call this symbiotic bacteria, meaning living together and benefiting us. So we have trillions of bacteria that live in the large intestine. Most of them are helpful. Generally, we need them and they help us survive. Without them, we would have significant abnormalities in terms of the efficiency at which our digestive system functions. Some of the bacteria produce vitamins, which are absorbed by the large intestine. Okay? Others play an important role in controlling the growth of harmful bacteria. So they break down indigestible food components as well. So some of these bacteria play an important role in attacking and getting rid of harmful bacteria that get into our large intestine. They also produce substances that help prevent colon cancer, antioxidants. We also, they play an important role in breaking down toxins before they can be poisonous to the body. So we've got these symbiotic bacteria that play an important role in our digestion. You would have heard of probiotics that a doctor might suggest that you take. And these probiotics, again, are useful bacteria that help to establish a good intestinal bacteria culture, which plays an important role in assisting our digestive system carry out its function. Finally, the process of egestion. All of the process of digestion has occurred. The chemical breakdown of food is a, has occurred. We've absorbed what we've needed, and we find that we're now left with the waste products. What is present in the waste products? So it's the waste products from what has not been needed, parts that haven't been digested. So you know that plant material cannot be digested. We do not have the enzyme cellulose that breaks down. We don't have the enzyme cellulase that breaks down cellulose. And so we need to ensure that all of those waste products are removed. So ejection is an important process in removing the waste products. If that does not happen, we end up with serious health conditions. We find that there's a buildup of toxins, which starts with constipation and then leads to other health complications. So all undigested material are transported 
through the colon where most water absorption takes place and your mineral salts are absorbed. The undigested material are temporarily stored in the rectum until ingested through the anus. The undigested waste is referred to as feces. The removal of the feces outside the body is called defecation. Why is it important to have roughage in our diet? Guys, roughage is important in our diet as it increases bulk and volume. Where does roughage come from? Roughage comes from a diet which is rich in plant material. When you're having your bran flakes and your cereals in the morning, those are important in increasing the volume of movement of food throughout your digestive system. And this increases peristalsis and prevents constipation. So we need to ensure that our diet has a large source of roughage. And that comes from the plant and animal material that we consume. Guys, that's a wrap. I didn't get a chance to get through looking at the application of questions. But I think it's important that when you go through the section that you're able to access questions based on the structure of the villi. Look at how it's structurally adapted for efficient absorption. Look at what happens to the nutrients once they're absorbed in the capillaries and transported. Guys, you've been a fantastic audience. I trust that you've enjoyed the engagement. From me, it's a wrap. See you soon. Have a bye lekker day. Cheers.